Hey, this is Dr. A. We're going to do an anatomy and physiology review on the lymphatic and immune systems. So as a quick overview, the function of the lymphatic system is that it picks up excess tissue fluid, it cleanses it, and it returns it to the circulatory system. And it also picks up the fats that are absorbed by the digestive system and then will ferry them into the circulatory system. Uh, the main function of the immune system is to fight disease and infections, and the organs of the lymphatic system are the lymph nodes, the lymph vessels, the thymus gland, the spleen, and the tonsils. This is just a schematic representation of the lymphatic system, showing that as the blood pumps arterial blood through arteries and arterioles into the capillary bed, that blood delivers fluid and nutrients to the cells in the body tissues, um, and some of uh, that you know fluid leaves the capillary circulation it's in the tissue bed and then some of it of course is going to return uh, to the ve venules and then veins uh, but what is not returning the venules and the veins will enter the lymphatic capillaries and the lymphatic circulation which will join up with uh, the vein um, the venous circulation and return back to the heart so that if all goes well, the amount of blood that leaves the heart is equal to the amount of blood that enters uh, the heart, uh, volume-wise anyway. So let's talk about the lymphatic vessels. Um, so they form a network of ducts throughout the body, uh, but they are one-way pipes that conduct lymph towards the thoracic cavity, and that lymph comes from the tissue beds from all over the body. Uh, so in that way, the lymphatic vessels and the um, lymphatic system is different from the circulatory system because the circulatory system is a closed loop. Um, so we go from heart to arter arteries and, uh, to capillaries and the tissue bed, from capillaries to veins, back to the heart. So that's, that's a loop. Uh, whereas in lymphatic vessels, um, they start as a dead end in the capillary bed and just connect to the venous circulation. So it is a low pressure system, just like the venous system is uh, a low pressure system. Um, and therefore it uses valves, just like in veins, to prevent the backflow of the lymphatic fluid and be, uh, be able to return it uh, back towards the heart. So the lymphatic vessels begin as very small lymph capillaries into tissues, and then the capillaries will merge, merge um, into uh, larger lymph vessels, and then finally the vessels will drain into one of two large lymphatic ducts. We have the right lymphatic duct and the th thoracic duct, and then those will merge into the venous circulation. Lymph nodes are small organs that are made of lymphatic tissue. They house the lymphocytes and uh, the antibodies that those lymphocytes produce, um, and those help remove pathogens and cell debris from lymph. They, there are also macrophages in um, the lymph nodes. Uh, they also trap and destroy cells from cancerous tumors, um, and lymph nodes are particularly concentrated in several body regions. So we have them in um, the armpits. Those are your axillary lymph nodes. Uh, and they drain your arms and shoulders. We have them in the neck here, and there, there are your cervical lymph nodes, and they drain the head and neck. Those might get swollen if you have a strep throat or a viral infection, um, you know, pharyngitis, pharyngitis, something like that. They, uh, you have some in the groin area, and um, they are the inguinal um, lymph nodes, and they drain the legs and the lower pelvis. And then you have some that are in the chest, and there are the mediastinal lymph nodes, and they drain the chest cavity. And you also have um, a bunch of lymphatic tissue around your digestive organs, but we're going to come back to that. Um, this is a representation of a lymph node. So uh, you can see the lymphatic vessels with valves that are entering the uh, lymph nodes, right? They're the afferent vessels. And then, uh, so the lymph fluid flows in here, then throws, uh, flow through these compartments. And this is where the lymphocytes, antibodies, and macrophages are all located. And then, it, so it gets cleaned up, and then it flows back out uh, into the efferent lymphatic vessels uh, as it continues to flow back towards the heart. 
So the tonsils are a collection of lymphatic tissue on each side of the throat. There are three sets of tonsils. You have your palatine tonsils, which are the ones um, that you, you know, your doctor might be looking at when he's looking at, in the back of your throat. And um, it's looking at the sides of the throat there to look see if there's a white patches back there, if it's red and swollen, to see if you might have strep throat. Um, you also have pharyngeal tonsils, which are often referred to as adenoids. And then you have lingual tonsils on uh, both sides of your tongue. Um, so lingua has to do with the tongue. And uh, the tonsils act as a filter to protect the body from pathogen invasion, very much like the lymph nodes do. Um, but they are not essential organs, and that's why sometimes uh, some people may have to have their tonsils removed, especially if the, the tonsils end up being a source of recurrent strep throat infection. The spleen is located in the left upper quadrant. Uh, it's tucked right next to the stomach. It consists of lymphatic tissue that is highly infiltrated with blood vessels, uh, and therefore the spleen actually cleans your blood, blood circulation. So the vessels will spread out in a slow moving blood sinuses that are lined with macrophages. And this is the main area where your blood is being filtered to remove all the old red blood cells. Uh, and as it destroys the old red blood cells, it can recycle the iron. Um, and it's also considered, considered a store of blood. Um, it is not an essential organ, so that um, if uh, for some reason there are problems with the spleen and it has to be removed, it can be removed. And then macrophages in the liver and other places in your body will take over the role of the macrophages that were in the spleen and will pull out old red cells and recycle them. The thymus gland is located in the upper portion of the mediastinum, so underneath your breastbone. Uh, it is essential for immune development. Uh, it secretes the hormone thymosin, which changes lymphocytes into T lymphocytes. And um, the thymus is active through adolescence, uh, and then it begins to shrink in size. So it's larger in infants, and it stays pretty big during childhood. Um, but then as you progress into adulthood, it gets smaller, and it, can, and it shrinks and shrinks as you get older. Um, and it's just really active in childhood because it helps with the development of immunity against diseases. And when you are a child, you get exposed to a lot of different diseases and viruses and pathogens. And... That's how you develop immunity. So in this diagram here, of um, we've got the chest and part of the abdominal cavity. We have, this is the thymus gland right here. It would be underneath the breastbone above the heart. Uh, not to be confused with this right here, which is the thyroid. And then your spleen is right here on the left side of the stomach uh, in the left upper abdominal quadrant. So let's talk a little bit about immunity. So immunity is the body's ability to defend itself against pathogens. There are two forms of immunity. It's natural or innate immunity. Uh, it is nonspecific, and it does not require a prior pathogen exposure to work. Um, so you have some set defenses against uh, pathogens um, as they are recognized in general without being very specific. Um, and so if... Um, you compare the uh, immune system or a body, if you will, to a castle, uh, the natural or innate immunity would be, you know, the moat around the castle and the castle walls and the drawbridge. There are things that just keep people out there. They keep the bad guys out, etc. And then you have the acquired immunity as the body's response to a specific pathogen, and it could be either passive or active. Um, but that would be more like um, the soldiers that are... Um, you know, patrolling the wall, but they are also like uh, targeting specific invaders or bad guys or something like that, or trying to get into the castle or the city. So that's just you know, kind of a somewhat good illustration. So uh, when you talk about passively acquired and actively acquired immunity, um, it depends on basically how this immunity is is uh, acquired. So uh, a passively acquired immunity is when a person receives um, already formed antibodies uh, or protective substances uh, and these have been produced by another human or even an animal. Uh, for example, 
the maternal antibodies that cross the placenta, but also the maternal antibodies that are found in breast milk. So that would be a passively acquired immunity that goes from mom to baby. Another one would be an antitoxin or a gamma globulin injection, um, you know, and an antitoxin to treat a snake bite, for example. Um, so that has been collected from another person that produces the antibodies to that toxin, and it's infused in the person that got bit by a snake. Uh, an actively acquired immunity develops following a direct exposure to a pathogen, which basically means from you either getting sick or getting immunized. So the pathogen will stimulate the immune response, and then when your body sees that pathogen again, it will recognize it very quickly and fight it off really quickly when to the point that where you don't even have symptoms. So immunizations or vaccinations will create um, an active acquired immunity uh, because they contain either weakened or modified pathogens. So um, pathogens are recognized as foreign because of their unfamiliar proteins, and that's what signals them as pathogens and we need to be um, acted on. Uh, these proteins are called antigens and they stimulate the immune response to produce antibodies. And so antibodies are made against antigens. Um, there are two distinct and different processes in the immune response. We have the antibody production, which is often referred to as humoral antibody, uh, sorry, humoral immunity or the antibody mediated immunity. And then we have cellular or cell mediated immunity. Now in cellular or cell mediated immunity, we have our lymphocytes, our T lymphocytes, are attacking cells, body cells that are either cancerous or infected with a virus of some sort. So they're, um, it's created, this type of immunity targets defective cells to remove them. So humoral immunity is a production of B lymphocytes or B cells, and B cells respond to antigens that, by producing antibodies. So the antibodies, antibodies will combine with the antigen on the pathogen to form an antigen antibody complex. And that antigen could be a spike on a virus. Um, it could be a little protein on the surface of a bacteria. So there are oral parasite. So anything that's seen as foreign can create the production of antibodies. And the complex can target the pathogen for phagocytosis, which is uh, for eating by other um, white cells. It can also prevent the pathogen from har harming healthy cells. So in the, the example of the virus with the spike proteins, the antibodies can cope the spike proteins. Well, the spike protein is what the virus uses to get inside the cells. And if they're coated with antibodies, then the virus cannot get inside of the cell. And then uh, cellular immunity involves the production of your T cells and your natural killer cells. Uh, the natural killer cells are more involved in the innate part of your uh, cellular immunity of the immune response, whereas the T cells are adaptive and specific. Um, these are cytotoxic defense cells because there are cells that are toxic to other cells. So that's why they're cytotoxic. Um, and so they physically attack and destroy pathogenic cells, which pathogenic cells can be cancer cells or uh, virally infected cells or um, any other cell that just doesn't belong. So we're going to look at nosocomial infections. So those are infections that are acquired in the hospital and they take several forms and we obviously want to prevent nosocomial infections. So um, it could be a cross infection. So this is when a pathogen is acquired from another person. So this could be through contaminated equipment uh, that's used in one patient and then used in another. Uh, so then the infection can spread from one person to the next. Um, and they're also through like dirty hands and uh, there's uh, all kinds of ways where uh, pathogens can be acquired from another person. Uh, it can be reinfection, so a person becomes infected again with the same pathogen, um, either because the infection wasn't completely cleared um, or it, they just got reinfected through the same route as the primary infection. And then self-inoculation, a pathogens could spread from one body site to another and then cause problem in that other body site. So. Um, when you get bacterial pneumonia, oftentimes that's kind of a self-inoculation where there are bacteria from your nasal passages and stuff that ended up getting into your lungs. Um, that's just one example. 
And how do we prevent these nosocomial infections is we use standard precautions. So these are used throughout hospitals and healthcare and you know, physician offices, et cetera. So um, the first one is to wash hands before putting on and after removing gloves and before and after working with each patient or patient equipment, which patient equipment should also be disinfected between patients. Um, wear gloves when in contact with any body fluid, mucous membrane, non-intact skin, or if you have chapped hands, a rash, or open sores. You should also wear a non-permeable gown or apron during procedures that are likely to expose you to any body fluid, mucous membranes, or non-intact skin. So if you're going to get, might be get splashed with stuff on you. And you should also wear a mask and protective eyewear or a face shield. There are also combo masks and face shield. Uh, and this is when patient, patients are coughing or if body fluid droplets or splashes are likely. So you just want to protect uh, all of your openings, your nose, mouth, and eyes from getting things splashed into them. So, all right, so that wraps up our uh, overview of the um, lymphatic and immune system for the little review of anatomy and physiology.